And we pray now all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, which will conclude for us chapter 1 of this book. So hear these words. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Well, we come to this passage, which as much of James seems to be oftentimes familiar, these familiar lines that are probably known if you've read through James before, to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And really this section here, James is organizing it around those three principles. And in fact, they're actually more than principles. James here is actually commanding us that this is how we're supposed to act. And so he begins by speaking about being quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And then he'll sort of invert these as he talks through them. And so verses 20 through 21, he'll deal with being slow to anger. And verses 22 through 25, it'll be quick to listen. And verse 26, it'll be slow to speak. And then he'll culminate in verse 27 with really the the thesis of the letter. What does it look like? What does true religion look like? And he says it's two primary points, as we'll see. And so as we come to James, it's again, it's, it's often said James is a very practical letter, and there's a lot of truth to that. But if you see what this book is trying to do, it is this pathway, it is this guide, it is offering up perfection. So it is more than just how to live wisely, though it's not less than that. But James here is saying, I want to offer you the thing that you desire most, is that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That all that God is doing in your life, and indeed this letter that he's writing to Christians who are struggling, he is doing so with an eye that they would find perfection and completeness, that they would find wholeness. They would be whole and complete as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are whole and complete, that the triune God is undivided, unlike humanity, which we know our hearts are easily divided and we are easily led astray. And so James is is offering us this view of what perfection looks like. And you'll remember from last evening's service that he then says, if you want that, to then begin praying for that wisdom, that wisdom that allows you to live rightly in God's world. And so here he comes with more ways in which he can help us on that path to perfection. And I think that's where this practical nature of James comes in. And that he says, I want to show you how to be perfect, how to be complete, how to have an undivided heart. And so I will show you and guide you and walk you down this path because think of how this can sound if someone were to come and offer you to say, I can help you to be perfect. You think, well, that's wonderful. How are you going to get me there? And James is saying, well, let me show you the path. Let me show you the path that Jesus had walked and I think the, the, the part of this book is it hits us so hard is that we see that this process of having our faith worked out is not an easy process. I mean, just as James begins to say, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, suddenly you, you realize how much he is ratcheting up the requirements that God has on his people. 
and what James is trying to get at. But I think also you, you hear these things and you think about the ways in which we come as, as the body of Christ, living as beloved brothers and sisters together. James is, is saying, here is how to live with others. Here's how to live as a holy community. For James isn't writing to a Christian. He's not writing to just this one Christian, some guy named Bob who has all of these problems, right? He's writing to the entirety. He's writing to all of those who would read this. He's writing to the dispersion, the 12 tribes. He's writing to Jewish Christians, and he's writing to us. And in fact, one of the things I think that when you look at James, one of the things he wants you to be thinking of as you read through this is he never really wants you to say, ah, that person needs this. James says, you need this that I need this. Because later on, he'll talk about putting off and putting on. He's talking about actions that that we are able to do, actions that we cannot do for somebody else. He talks about putting away wickedness and putting on or receiving this implanted word. James is, is really, he's offering that mirror for us to look into. He's offering the perfect law, the law of liberty, that that we would look into it and gaze into it and then understand what God requires of us. And so James begins his section after these three commands. He he does begin by speaking to them as beloved brothers, beloved brothers and sisters is how he opens the second section. And I think he he does that as he's going to say difficult things. He, He begins by reminding them of this relationship that they have that they are beloved, that he, he loves them, and that is why he is writing to them. But I think also he's just, in, he's just bringing, out, bringing this to light of, of who they are in Christ, that Paul will often use this word beloved in ways to, to speak about our relationship, that we are those who are beloved by Christ. Just think of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And he talks about this in Ephesians chapter 1, that in love he predestined us. And I think subtly here, James is bringing this to light with beloved brothers, that they are those who are loved by James, but more importantly, loved by the Lord. And it's here that then he gets into how then they should act as those who are beloved. And he begins by saying, you should be slow to anger in verse 19. And in verse 20, he then gives us that why, because one could ask, why should I be slow to anger? And James says, well, the main reason is, is that your anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And what is he saying here? Because Paul will often use the term righteousness of God, and it seems that Paul has in mind this righteousness that, that comes from God. But here, James seems to be looking at it from another perspective, that idea of producing the righteousness that God requires of us, that this type of sinful anger doesn't produce in us a righteous character. And it seems likely here that he could be having in view not just a general anger, a general sinful anger, but an anger directed towards God. Because he's speaking to those brothers and sisters who are going through trials of various kinds. He's just spoken of speaking of God as the tempter, and how that is wrong to view God as the one who tempts, for he cannot tempt. That God will use this to test. He's spoken of God as the one who is generous, and that we should have faith in his generosity. He talks about God as the giver of every good and perfect gift, the Father of lights. And so here he talks about the anger of man. And it could be that he's, he's indicating this anger in the, the situation that one finds themselves in, this anger at God over what he's doing, but also in general, just the general sinful anger that is prone for us as sinful people. There is a thing as righteous anger, and there is a way in which anger can be used by God to produce good things, but here James is certainly setting his sight on this unrighteous anger that can arise in us. And if you think about those times, if you've ever been unrighteously angry, what does that produce in you? Especially if you then go and say something in the midst of your unrighteous anger. 
Or in my case, you send an email late at night in your unrighteous anger. And then you spend the next day apologizing for saying that. That's a true story. And I should have thought about that before I started preaching this sermon. But you think about it, it doesn't produce anything good in you. And so James is saying, don't be this way. This is not the the path that you should be following. This is not the produce that you want to be developing. You do not want to be sowing and planting these seeds of anger because what's going to grow out of them is not good. And so then in verse 21, he then says, there is a better way. And he says, there's two things that we are to do. We are to take off and we are to receive. He says here, therefore, take off or put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. This idea of dirtiness or or filthiness. He's really talking about it in a a moral way, dealing with our our moral defects. And then he says rampant wickedness or or excessive wickedness. Speaking of our, our sinful, evil character that we're to, to shed these things. And it seems as if the, the illustration then could be, I mean, you simply imagine a rainy day and a rugby match and what you look like coming in after that rainy day and that rugby match. And you can just imagine somebody covered in head to toe, soiled in mud and muck and dirt, walking into the house and plopping themselves down on the couch and putting their boots up. In my house, that wouldn't last very long. But the idea is to to get rid of that, to to shed that, to see your moral defects, to see your evil character, to see the sins that beset you and to to shed those and to get rid of those. And then he says, and to receive with humility, with meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. And James here, when he talks about be, be meek or be humble, you know, he's not talking about us needing to be doormats, being people who are just walked over. That's not what James really has in mind, as if you're not to have a, a backbone or to speak truth in situations. That not, that's not what James is getting at. But one commentator, he put it this way, he's, but rather he's talking that we should be those people who are patient, self-effacing, free from malice, anger, and arrogance. Those should not be the things that characterize a Christian. Paul speaks of it this way. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And you can see what James is is getting at here, this humility, this implanted word. And then he moves on to say, this is able to save your souls. In many ways, we, we just simply move to Christ and we think about Christ and we think about what it is that Jesus has done, how Jesus has responded, how did Jesus act, and then we follow that path. Paul does it well in Philippians 2. He says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's so much in there. And I think Paul and James are certainly mirroring the same things about talking about our relationships and how to relate and live with one another, but also to relate and live with God. You can think of the parables that Jesus speaks of about the ways in which we respond to God. He talks about meekness. He talks about basically this way of looking at God as the one who is great and we as the ones who are not, that we need to receive everything from him. And here indeed, there's this implanted word. And one way of thinking about this implanted word is simply that to be students of the word. 
Spurgeon talked about John Bunyan. He said he was a man who bleeds Bible. His blood was bibline, to coin a word. And if you've ever read the Pilgrim's Progress, you'll see it is there are verses after verses after verses after verses after verses of Scripture that John Bunyan, of, of all that he did, he knew his Bible well. And James would certainly want us to be hearers of the Word, to be steeped in the Word, to have our speech seasoned with the Word, to have our lives ordered by the Word. I think that's absolutely true. But I think the idea here that he speaks about this implanted Word is in a sense something that has already happened. That's happened in the new birth. Jeremiah 33, 31, 33 speaks about the law being placed upon our hearts. That in the new birth you have been changed. And that God is already at work inside of you. Paul will go to great lengths to show that what God starts, he finishes. What he has started changing you, he continues that process through to the very end. And so here James is saying, here is a better way, a path of humility like the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a way of being slow to anger in order to produce true and lasting righteousness. I mean, you just have to imagine living with folks like that, who are slow to anger but abounding in humility. Well, then James continues that we are to be a people who are quick to listen. It's almost as if he set up a contrast here. Earlier, he spoke of being quick to hear, and now he says, Do be doers of the word and not hearers only. I think the contrast that he's pointing out is that there are those who act without listening and those who are listening without acting. And you can think of the, the background to this seems to be the same wisdom that Jesus is speaking of in the Sermon on the Mount. And as we, we come here thinking of being quick to listen, it's to hear what the Word of God is saying to us. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, when asked what is really the purpose of the Bible, what does the Bible do, what does Scripture principally teach, it is what we are to believe concerning God and what duties God requires of us. That the Word of God teaches us who this great God is and all of its massive attributes of who the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit are, and then how we are to respond to that. And think about that too. That means James and what he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has actually just commanded us. So the slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to hear are, are not suggestions or personality types. James is saying, this is how you are supposed to be. And if you think about that, when we come to these great commands, how do we stack up? How do we do with those? Or with Jesus, to love God and love neighbor. Or as James will say later on, even to love the poor. And then he goes on to demonstrate the almost silliness of somebody who hears but fails to act. He talks about a man who looks into a mirror and then goes away forgetting what he looks like. I almost had the harebrained idea to just shave half my beard and just come in and let everyone look at that and be like, how could you forget to do that? How could you forget to shave the other side of your beard? What person does that? What person looks in the mirror and does that and then somehow leaves with half a shaved face? Or a lady who's putting on lipstick and somehow just gets one side of the face or one eye with eyeliner or just combing half of your hair. We don't do that. That would be silly to be that forgetful. But then all we have to do is ask what happens to our sermons on Monday? And I'm not just saying that as the one preaching, as you should all listen to what I say, I should listen to what I say. Or when you read your Bible and it tells you how to behave, how to believe and how to respond, how well do we do with taking that on board? And, and, and you know, it's almost as if osmosisly to absorb that and say, is this changing us? 
Because I think in the end, a, a big point of what James is trying to get at is he's trying to dismantle an easy believism. He is trying to dismantle this idea that, well, I prayed a prayer and I am saved. And James seems to be saying, I don't care. What I want to know is, are you a changed person? Does your life bear these fruits that the Spirit is working in you? And he says here, this perfect law, that one who looks onto the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He offers us this great blessing. He will be blessed. He will be happy here. And think about the way he uses the term perfect law. He's already said, do you want to be perfect and complete? And here he says, here is this law. Here is this standard that is perfect. But he also calls it the law of liberty. I think it's a, a fascinating way of putting law and liberty together. Do we often think that, that having a law actually brings with it liberty? Usually we sometimes think of a law as a way to re- prevent us from having our freedom. I mean, certainly we saw that, and the governments can do that at different times. But Jesus, but the law that God gives, it's not a burden, but rather a delight. I mean, think, for instance, some of the Ten Commandments, do not steal and do not commit adultery and do not murder. Thinking of certainly don't steal and don't murder, I tend to like those laws. I like those laws that protect me. And you think of Jesus who came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. In Galatians 5.1, Paul speaks of Christ bringing this freedom. But if you think about what he's talking about, he's actually talking about there, there are two different authorities. There are two different, if you will, taskmasters. There's Satan and the way that he binds and chains and enslaves and abuses. And then there's the Lord Jesus Christ who offers freedom but you're still serving a master. And then in verse 26, he continues on with, now slow to speak. And this is, a, a, this is something that James will return to again in chapter 3, even using the same metaphor of a tongue being bridled like you bridle a horse. And as he'll go on, as you, you control the horse with this small bit, and so the tongue can do a lot of damage. And here he seeds this at the beginning by saying, if you can't control your tongue, you're deceiving your heart and your religion is worthless. It's almost like, well, tell us, James, how do you really feel about the subject? But you think of the way in which words hurt. You think of the way in which we can use our tongues to such evil intentions and how we can hurt and wound. And oftentimes it's usually the people closest to us. And James said it should not be so. Rather, those who have been changed by the Holy Spirit should be those who speak in a way that is consummate with who they are. You see this in the, in the book of Proverbs that it gets to the point that it's better to say nothing than to say something Uh, that will hurt. Proverbs 10 says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs 29, 20, do you see a man who is hasty in words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Or we think of Job's counselors. Had they just commiserated there in silence, they would have actually made Job's life a lot better. I mean, think about just that silent commiseration is better than quick badly given advice, isn't it? And so James now comes to the end of chapter one, really the the end of the introductory material here of themes that he'll continue to deal with. And in verse 27, he says, here is what true religion looks like. Here is religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father. It is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I love the way James puts this. Paul seems to say the same thing where he speaks about all of this great theology that he's doing and the ways in which he's talking with the apostles about this great gospel that's going forth. And he tells us there was only one thing they added. 
They said, remember the poor, something I was eager to do. And you see here this, this way in which James is talking that the church should be at the forefront of caring for those who are the most vulnerable. This idea that often terms social justice, which gets a bad rap sometimes. Here, James is saying this is something that should concern Christians. But note the way he is not overemphasizing one extreme over the other. He's not saying you should care for everyone at the expense of your personal holiness and the expense of what God has commanded. But rather, he says the, the other twin pole is to keep oneself unstained from the world. And see, really here he is bringing together this need for personal holiness and personal reform with also a looking out into how we can bring the gospel of Christ to bear. And James will go further to say he's not simply talking about just bringing forth the gospel without any care for the physical body. I think James is trying to say we, we are body and soul, that there's good to care for the body as it is to care for the soul. And that Christians, above all, should be people who care for both. And so here, James ends the introductory material. <laughs> and you almost think chapter 1 seems like maybe that's enough. But James will continue because we have a big problem. He's like a doctor when he's, give, when he's given you his diagnosis. He said sin seems to be running rampant in this church. The heart is divided. And so how do we help? And I think one of the things that brings out the book of James and, and what I'm in, enjoying about it, even though it's hard in many places, is James seems to just be simply saying, put the car into gear. Now, I drive an automatic car and don't necessarily know how a manual works, but I can understand the principles behind it. I can also sit in neutral, and if I sit in neutral, I'm not doing anything and I can't go anywhere. And so there's a, there's a way in which James is like, put this thing into gear. That we are to act in these ways. We are to behave in these ways. We are to put our faith into action. He'll say as much later, yet faith is proved by your works. The, the internal is brought out into the external. Right? If we sit and idle, there's a, there's a need where, where holiness is not something that just happens by simply contemplating it. The last I checked, nobody really just becomes holy from simply meditating on holiness. It comes from the interaction and from the doing, right? To, to be slow to speak is to be put into situations where you have to not say something in order to see your holiness tested, to see your strength, your steadfastness that is being produced by the testing of your faith. To be slow to anger means you actually have to be put into situations that are going to make you angry, that are going to test how you respond. James is talking about people who listen and people who are humble and people who care for the least of these as tangible ways in which we see holiness worked out. And really, it leads to that theology and that the word, that, that everything that we have, that church, that worship, all of it is leading to practical outworkings in our life. And when we stall out or find ourselves going in reverse, we come back to Christ. We come back to his word. We come back and we find relationship. We come back because there's a relationship there. That's why I think this beginning of this section with beloved brothers and sisters, that they are beloved not just by James, but by Jesus. And Paul says this, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, as children who are loved. There's a relationship that precedes the demands for holiness. The Israelites were saved and then given the Ten Commandments. You were redeemed and then given the Holy Spirit and then from this great theological foundation, there is set forth now how we are to go and to live amongst the outside world and inside the church. And so, brothers and sisters, James is not an easy book. <laughs> but praise be to God that we have it here in his word. 
And James doesn't mince words. But I think the, the key to this is not to just feel bad. The key is to, to see in our own hearts, but also to look at what a church would look like that looked like this. Look at what your life would look like if it looked like this. I think James is, is saying, yes, there's problems, but guess what? There is actually a solution. There is actually hope. There is actually the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Let's pray.